So our next speaker is Dr. Maria Kia, and she's going to be talking about dwarf galaxies near the Milky Way. Thanks. Uh, so on my way out from very snowy New Haven, Connecticut uh, to Hawaii, I stopped off in Los Angeles for a couple of days, and this is not my normal thing, but I happened to uh, interact with some Hollywood people. And it's super clear that your social status depends on your entourage. How many people are in your, your entourage increases how important you are, you know, assistance and that sort of thing. And so uh, applying the rules of Hollywood to astrophysics is probably dangerous, but I'll just go ahead and do that. Uh, the Keck telescopes have increased the social status of the Milky Way tremendously. In the last five years, uh, we've doubled the number of small satellite galaxies uh, around the Milky Way, and we in fact think that there may be hundreds of small satellites uh, around the Milky Way. So the Keck really has done quite a bit in terms of the, the social status of the, of the Milky Way. And it really has opened up an entire new field. Um, this is the field of near-field cosmology, using the Milky Way and the satellites to study big questions, asking uh, sort of what's the underlying cosmology, um, and a lot of really interesting new questions. And so I don't really have to exaggerate when I say that Keck has really transformed uh, this field. It's created this field in some sense. So uh, Yale University is a relatively new partner uh, to the Keck uh, community. We're, uh, I think we've had Keck access for about three years. Um, it's also not an understatement that uh, Keck has contributed to our social status. Uh, Yale University, our astronomy department, has really started to thrive in the last couple of years, and it really is directly related to Keck access. Okay, so this is an image uh, of M31. Uh, this is our nearest galaxy. We think it looks something like the Milky Way. It's hard to take an image of the Milky Way itself. Um, this might be a familiar image because it's a screensaver on the Mac OS 10.7. <laughs> um, the two interesting things in this image that I like the most are these two, oh, let me use the other laser pointer. Um, these two objects here, M32 and NGC 205. In the uh, Apple screensaver, they actually airbrushed out the lower dwarf galaxy for reasons I don't fully understand. Um, these are two fairly luminous dwarf galaxies around M31. Um, the objects that I'm gonna be talking about today, these new satellites are incredibly faint and I can't even show you a very good image of them and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But to understand why the dwarf galaxies are interesting and important in understanding uh, both the Milky Way and galaxy formation, we need to think a little bit about how the Milky Way actually forms. Um, so let me show you a movie. Um, this is a numerical simulation of what will become the Milky Way um, starting at extremely early times. So this is a numerical simulation that starts out with basically the underlying parameters of the universe and lets uh, the, lets the mass in the, in the simulation evolve just based on gravity. There aren't any stars or gas or dust or people in these simulations. Um, that seems maybe like a, uh, an oversight. Um, but the normal mass, the stuff that we're made out of, electrons and protons and that sort of thing, we think constitutes only a small fraction of the total mass in the, uh, in the universe, something like 10%, less than that. Um, and so. Most of the mass in the universe is made out of dark matter. Dark matter is a particle. We don't quite know what kind of particle yet, but we know it exists, and we know that it interacts basically only uh, via gravity. And so we do these, these, do these sort of simulations with uh, dark matter only, um, and these simulations seem to represent what we see in the universe. If we look at large galaxies and compare the observations to the simulation, things actually work fairly well. It means that we have a pretty good understanding of how galaxies evolve um, in, this, in this universe. Um, the picture that I showed you earlier, um, all the, the luminous mass in the Milky Way would sort of sit right in the middle of this uh, large, um, large region. And what you'll notice is that there's a lot of little things there. There's a lot of small structure. Maybe these are dwarf galaxies, lots of little small things around it. And here's the problem. So the simulations predict there should be something like a few thousand uh, satellites around something like a Milky Way galaxy. And as of 2005, we knew of 11. Those are different numbers. This is not a very creative name, but this is called the missing satellite problem. And in 2005, uh, sort of around early 2000, this was a major problem in cosmology. If the simulations are right and they're predicting things at the large scales really well, there's a major failure at the small scales. Why are they under-predicting the number of satellites that we see by a factor of 100? Um, so there's a couple ways this could be wrong. One, maybe the entire simulation, maybe our understanding of cosmology is just simply wrong and we have to start over again. 
Another possibility is that the observers are wrong. In 2005, I would have argued vigorously that we were totally right. We knew all the dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Um, but there was another solution uh, to this, and that's what people were talking about Kodabite, is that this is a dark matter simulation, and what we're seeing are stars, so luminous stars. And so maybe the way we place galaxies, luminous stars, into these dark matter, uh, we call them halos, um, into these dark matter structures um, is different than we understand, and we have to sort of uh, modify the physics of how galaxies form. And so this, is a, uh, this was a major discussion, and it turns out, much to my whatever, is that the, the observers were actually wrong. In 2013, we now know of 25 satellites around the Milky Way. This maybe doesn't seem like it's getting up to 1,000. We haven't really solved the problem, but the difference between 11 and 25 is when the number was 11, I was convinced the number was 11, and it wasn't much more than that. With 25 satellites, we've only searched a very, very small region of parameter space. We know that uh, we haven't searched the entire sky, we haven't searched the sky very deeply. So we predict that there should be something like a few hundred, maybe up to 500 luminous satellites around the Milky Way. And that's getting us much closer to the predictions. Um, and so this missing satellite now problem, which used to be a factor of a few hundred, is now maybe like a small missing satellite issue. Um, and there's a, a factor of maybe two difference between what we observe and um, what we predict, and therefore we, we really have much more confidence in the underlying cosmology. Um, okay, so these new satellites, in addition to uh, helping us understand cosmology, also turn out to be really interesting. Um, so 14 satellites discovered. The Keck telescope has uh, confirmed all the, uh, 13 out of the 14 of these objects and has been incredibly critical in understanding the properties of these things. These, we call them ultra-faint galaxies because they're extremely low luminosity. And there's lots of cool extremes we can use when we're talking about these things. So these new galaxies turned out to be the least luminous galaxies that we know. They're also the least chemically enriched. Um, and they turn out to be the most dark matter dominated galaxies. So lots of great uh, extremes. Uh, they're the least luminous galaxies. And in fact, it made us start to question what is a galaxy. The total luminosity of my favorite galaxy, I have a favorite galaxy, you have a favorite star, um, Segway 1 is only 300 times the luminosity of our sun. Compare that to the Milky Way, which is 10 to the 11th times the, uh, the luminosity of our sun. So these, this thing, these are puny, there are very few stars in them. Um, and yet we do think these are galaxies. The stars in these objects um, are uh, extremely metal poor. So astronomers call metals anything that's not hydrogen and helium. Um, all things other than a hydrogen and helium are created in supernova as star formation proceeds. And so the fact that these things don't have very many metals or are chemically um, unenriched means that they probably formed uh, uh, not many generations uh, of stars, which is pretty interesting. And finally, these are the most dark matter dominated galaxies. The stars that we are seeing are the absolute tip of a very large iceberg. Um, and the mass to light ratio, that is how much mass we infer versus how much luminosity we see, is gigantic. It's factors of a few thousand. Um, it turns out, in my last slide on this I'll, I'll talk about, these turn out to be great experiments, uh, laboratories for particle physics and trying to understand the actual nature of dark matter. I have two more extremes that I can list now. This is only the last couple of months. Um, we now have ages for these objects, and they turn out to be the oldest galaxies um, that we've ever seen before. And this is more for the astronomers in the room, but I'm so excited I can't not talk about it. Um, we're perhaps seeing the first direct evidence by counting stars of a non-universal IMF. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So this is a great list of, of amazing things. How do we miss these things? Why do we only find them a couple of years ago? Um, and so let me just talk about how these objects are found. This is an image of Segway 1. There is no amount of imagination um, that you can use to figure out where this object actually is. Um, the problem, and the reason we didn't find these objects until very recently, is that the Milky Way stars are overwhelming the stars in this galaxy. So imagine you're looking at a, gal a dwarf galaxy that's just beyond the Milky Way. Um, we're seeing stars, we're resolving this galaxy into individual stars. But the problem is we have to look through the Milky Way itself. And so we uh, see stars in our own Milky Way as well as the stars in the dwarf galaxy. The solution to trying to find this uh, dwarf galaxy is that the stars in the Milky Way and the stars in this dwarf galaxy have different colors and luminosities. Um, there's a very well prescribed uh, color and luminosity for stars when they're born and we can use that fact to get rid of the Milky Way stars. And so what I will do is remove all the things that are not in this dwarf galaxy, Milky Way stars mostly, background galaxies, 
Um, and this is my galaxy. You can't see it, so I'll just circle all the stars. All these circles are stars that have colors and luminosities, colors and brightnesses that are consistent with being at the same distance. Um, so I'll put back the rest of the objects in there, and you can see that you really would not have been able to figure out that there's an object there without doing an a algorithm and, and uh, filtering some of these Milky Way stars out. And so the, in order to do this technique, we need a large homogeneous survey of the sky. And so the reason these objects have only been recently found is because the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in sort of 2004, 2005 gave us this first digital image of the sky, and we're able to do this search algorithmically for the first time. Now, this is only giving me uh, a candidate galaxy. I now know that there are stars with colors and magnitudes that are consistent with being uh, all at the same distance, but I don't actually confirm this. I'm not actually sure that this is a galaxy. Maybe this is just a random chance that the stars happen to line up sort of in the same way. Um, what we need to do is confirm that these stars are actually associated, um, and then measure, using the, um, these stars, we can actually measure the mass. We need to do spectroscopy of these individual stars. These stars are very faint. We need a very large telescope to do this. Um, and the Keck telescope really is the one place we can do this. Now, in 2007, we had 10 candidate dwarf galaxies, 10 of these um, candidates. And it was two weeks before I went to the Keck telescope with my collaborator, Josh Simon, uh, to confirm these objects uh, when I gave my job talk at Yale. And I remember distinctly giving this talk saying, well, we've got all these candidates. We think they're the missing satellites. We think these are going to be very interesting objects. Um, but you know, we're, we haven't gotten to the telescope yet. And I think I said, and uh, Peter Van Dokum's here. You can maybe remember this. I said, maybe half of these things, these candidates, are going to be real. Privately, I thought maybe one of them was going to be real. It turns out every single candidate that we followed up at that Keck run, it was three nights. It was beautiful weather. Every single one of these was a dwarf galaxy that was dark matter dominated. So it was really pretty amazing. Um, well, how can we actually do this work? So uh, this is kind of a Goldilocks problem. The stars in the ultra-faint galaxies, these stars are faint, yet we require fairly high uh, spectral resolution to measure accurate velocities and to, to measure their masses. And so uh, the Deimos spectrograph is the perfect spectrograph for this work. And I want to thank Sandy Faber for this foresight before these objects were actually ever discovered or even known to exist, um, for designing a spectrograph that is so well matched to this problem. And there really is no other spectrograph in the world that's as well designed um, to uh, address this problem. Um, in addition, uh, we need an extremely stable instrument that has fairly well characterized systematics. And I'll talk about why in a second. Um, so you saw some uh, examples of spectrum uh, spectra from this morning. Um, this is an example from a small chunk of data from one uh, uh, Deimos mask. The stars are running ver uh, horizontally, no, vertically. Um, we're able to measure something like 150 stars um, uh, in a couple of hours to measure their velocities. The difference between this spectrum and the spectrum we saw this morning was that this spectrum was taken on Sunday. Um, we just had a, a, another moderately successful run uh, on Sunday. Uh, uh, I'll talk about those data in a bit. Okay, so we have these spectra. Um, the spectra and the stars, we see absorption lines. We see um, chemical fingerprints that we can use to measure the velocities, basically do the Doppler shift um, for these stars. Um, and this is what the data look like. So um, I have all these stars. I measure their velocities. Um, and um, right. um, here are just a histogram of the velocities that I measured um, from uh, that previous image. This is a plot of their colors and their brightnesses. And so what you see is that there's a lot of stars kind of right around zero velocity. This is what you might expect for a Milky Way star. Now imagine you're in the Milky Way, we're in the, uh, uh, with the sun, we're orbiting around the Milky Way, and stars nearby us are gonna have the same relative velocity. And so there's a lot of stars that have uh, a relative velocity relative to the sun of zero, um, and then there's some distribution around that. And if I plot the expectation of what, given a, a model of the Milky Way, what I expect the Milky Way to look like. That's the distribution of velocities in the, uh, of Milky Way stars. And you can see that there is a clear peak where there shouldn't be a peak. We don't expect a peak. Um, and this is, the, this is how we confirm these, these galaxies. We think that this is a, a stars that are associated with these other gravitationally um, in these galaxies. Okay, so now, if I think these stars are associated, I can actually measure 
the mass. I can use the width of that distribution to measure their masses. And so this is just uh, using some of the formulas I think that uh, Andrea showed in her talk, basically asking, um, thanks, um, what is the relative velocities of stars in this object? And I can then use that with a size to infer a mass. If I ask first, what is the mass that I would expect? So if I see all the stars, I know how massive a star is, I can add that all up, convert that into a dispersion, into a width, I would expect that the, oh, oh well. um, I would expect that the mass, if there were just stars in this object, would be something like half a kilometer a second. Okay, I can now go and measure the mass, uh, measure the, the width of that peak. Um, and for this particular object, we measure something like uh, about 10 times larger, well, four or five times larger. Um, the key here is that I know how to measure my errors. And I'm quite certain, and this keeps me up at night, um, but I'm quite certain that the, um, the dispersion of that is not 0.5. Uh, it's definitely much larger than that. And so based on the dispersion I measure, I infer a much larger mass. And therefore, if I'm inferring a much larger mass that I don't see, this is missing mass. This is dark matter. Um, and so really, this is the evidence that these objects are dark matter dominated. We're simply inferring kinematically, dynamically, a ma much larger mass than we actually see. Um, and so just to pause for a second, and, and it, this really relies on being able to measure velocities extremely accurately and understanding the systematics. And because DEMOS is a very stable instrument where we can characterize the errors extremely well, it really enables this sort of work to, to actually happen. Um, it turns out that all of the dwarf galaxies that we have measured have uh, velocity dispersions that are much larger than we expect from the stars, and therefore all of the newly discovered objects um, are dominated by dark matter. You call this a galaxy. So this is an image of one of the, the classical dwarf galaxies, the ones we knew of before 2005. You can clearly see stars that are sort of aggregated together. Um, this object is about a thousandth, a thousandth uh, as bright as the Milky Way. This is uh, one of our new galaxies. Again, the images are just really um, unimpressive. Um, and this is one, one, one hundredth as bright as the Milky Way, and yet we're inferring fairly large masses for these objects. So you might worry and say, gosh, you know, is this really a galaxy? It has dark matter, but is it really a galaxy? We have one more observation that makes us uh, quite convinced that these objects are in fact galaxies, and that is we can measure the chemistries of stars in these objects. The Milky Way, as we look at the Milky Way, we see multiple generations of stars. There's stars constantly forming and dying in galaxies. And so we might uh, say, well, a galaxy maybe is something that has had multiple generations of stars. Um, if there's multiple generations of stars, stars explode. Um, it uh, generates uh, lots of elements. New stars form out of those elements. And so you uh, see a spread in the chemical abundances of various different stars. And that suggests that there have been multiple generations of star formation. Um, and indeed, in this very small galaxy, Segway 1, we see evidence for a very large spread in the chemical abundances. And so here is a, a, a snippet of a spectrum. These three bright lines, are, uh, strong lines, are uh, lines from calcium. And you can actually just see it by eye that there are strong lines at the top and weak lines at the bottom. And so in this very tiny galaxy, it has a luminosity of 300 uh, times the mass, uh, luminosity of the sun. We're seeing this huge chemical spread, suggesting that this galaxy did in fact have multiple generations of stars. And again, all of the ultrafaint galaxies have very large metallicity spreads. We can go one step further, um, and we can measure detailed different kinds of abundances. Um, and uh, this, these are gal uh, those are uh, data from all, uh, I think, eight or nine of our objects. Um, here I'm plotting uh, the iron abundance, the abundance of iron in these stars, um, as a function of a different kind of element, and I'm not going to explain that. But what we see is that there's a clear trend. Um, and we interpret this trend as evidence for multiple generations of stars and have a, a, can put a minimum duration on the star formation in this object of about 100 million years, the time scale for a, a, a supernova to go off. So we can put a minimum duration on the star formation. We can also put a maximum, duration, uh, uh, maximum time scale on the duration. We can actually measure the ages of these objects. Um, the ultrafin galaxies are extremely small. If they've had multiple generations of stars, it's actually kind of difficult to, do the, to, to figure out how that would happen in the present-day universe. 
Basically, there's so little gas in these objects and there's uh, the, uh, so little stars that just the ambient radiation field of the Milky Way and uh, stars around, uh, um, just stars in the, in the universe would actually basically evaporate all the gas in these objects. And so there's a hypothesis that all the stars in these galaxies had to form very early before there was, thanks, um, before there was a, a very large radiation field. That is, all the stars in the ultrafaint should have formed before the epoch of reionization. Um, we can measure the ages of these objects very exquisitely using the Hubble Space Telescope and Keck data as a supporting actor where we can measure the metallicities. Um, and here we would expect as, as stars get, uh, populations get older, you can see stars uh, turning off. We can use this um, turn off as an indication of how old the uh, galaxies are. We can do this from the ground, but the ground-based data, we really can't differentiate between something that's kind of old and something that's super old. With the Hubble Space Telescope, combined with our Keck spectroscopy, we can actually measure the age extremely precisely. So here's a Hubble Space Telescope um, uh, plot of magnitude again in color. Um, and I have an isochrome. The, the width of this turnoff is incredibly tight. And I probably should have showed uh, an example of a, uh, somewhere where we, we see multiple generations of stars. But we can put an incredibly tight limit on the age of this object to within one billion years of when the, uh, the, gal uh, when the universe formed. So it's incredibly tight. All three of the objects that we've looked at so far have uh, ages that are within the same error bars, and suggesting that star formation was turned off on these objects basically at the same time. That is, maybe the star formation was turned off because uh, of reionization. OK, um, the last, ah, I wanted to talk about the IMF. Um, I'm going to do this real quick, and I'm going to do this just for the astronomers, because I'm so excited about this. Um, there is evidence from indirect, uh, um, uh, indirect uh, observations that the IMF in very massive galaxies uh, may be bottom heavy. That is, there may be lots of uh, more low mass stars as compared to the Milky Way um, uh, from indirect measurements. We have now measured the initial mass function for the ultrafaint galaxies, and we see the exact opposite. We see evidence for bottom light IMF. So here is uh, the mass as a function of the uh, number. That's the Milky Way. Um, for the Milky Way, at least at these masses, the, um, if we fit a slope to that, it is a Salpeter slope. Um, here are the initial mass functions for the other four galaxies in which we can measure the initial mass function directly from counting stars. So this is the small Magellanic clouds, um, Ursa Minor, which is another dwarf galaxy, and our two ultrafaint galaxies. And you can see visually that the slope seems to be turning over. And if I just plot the slope that I measure of the initial mass function, as a function of, let's say, the mass of the galaxy, the velocity dispersion of the galaxy, we're seeing a pretty clear trend. Um, this is a, another Keck um, uh, result. This is from uh, Peter Van Dokum and Charlie Conroy's indirect measurements of the IMF for massive galaxies. And so the ultrafaints uh, basically are giving us, um, it really underlies the utility of the ultrafaints for extending kind of the baseline of physical properties. Um, and so we can actually see this variation in the IMF. OK, my last point. Um, the ultrafaints, in addition to understanding galaxy formation, also, use, are, also provide us a laboratory for directly studying dark matter itself. Um, so the dark matter particle, again, we don't know exactly what it is, but there's a hypothesis that it's this uh, WIMP particle, a weakly interacting massive particle. Um, these particles, although they're dark and they don't uh, emit light, are occasionally predicted to collide with each other uh, and produce something that's an observable, an observable gamma ray photon, a fairly high energy photon. And so dark matter, in this case at least, is not strictly dark. This only happens when dark matter densities are fairly high, so you need to look in places where the, um, the dark matter density is high. And it's a photon, so it actually needs to be relatively close to us to, to actually be able to see uh, the photons. So if you wanted to uh, see this and try and see whether or not uh, you can measure this annihilation signal and detect dark matter, you might want to look somewhere where the dark matter density is highest, let's say the center of the galaxy. Um, where the dark matter density was high, the center of the galaxy is relatively close to us. The problem with looking at the center of the galaxy is that it also produces gamma ray photons from every other uh, physical process that you can come up with. And so the dwarf galaxies are clean systems. We don't expect them to produce gamma rays otherwise from astrophysical sources. And so if we do see gamma rays coming from the dwarf galaxies, from the ultrafaint galaxies, 
we may actually have a detection of dark matter that gives us some understanding of what this particle actually is. And so combining uh, gamma ray satellites, so gamma ray uh, images of these dwarf galaxies, combined with the masses we're measuring from the Keck telescope, um, gives us constraints on the dark matter particle itself. And right now, there are no detections, otherwise somebody would have a Nobel Prize. Um, the constraints from the ultra-faint galaxies actually rule out a fairly large parameter space in dark matter. And these are some of the tightest constraints on what dark matter is not. OK, um, so just to summarize, the ultra-faint galaxies are uh, extreme in many, many different ways. And it's giving us insight both into galaxy formation as, as well as particle physics. Um, and there are hundreds more satellites out there to be discovered. Thanks. <laughs>